on December 16th of last year in a city that is ravaged by crime, in a police department that has short upwards of 400 personnel. Baltimore City Police Officer Kiana Holly was gunned down as she sat in a police car. Seven days after two men approached her from behind and opened fire as she sat in her police car, the 39-year-old officer, who had been on a job for only two years, died only two days before Christmas. So far this year, there have been two officers that have been shot in the state of Maryland, a state where countless elected officials continue to demonize the brave men and women of law enforcement. Today, we're joined by Clyde Boatwright, president of the Maryland Fraternal Order of Police, and Mike Mancuso, president of the Baltimore City FOP Lodge Number 3. I'm Patrick Yost, National President of Fraternal Water Police, and this is The Blue View. Well, gentlemen, thank you for joining us today on The Blue View. Uh, Clyde, why don't we start with you? Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your background. Yeah, I've spent the last 22 years in law enforcement here in the state of Maryland, uh, including the last 19 with my current police department, the Baltimore City School Police. I've uh, spent the last 13 years as uh, local union president. Um, I've been on the uh, Maryland State Board since uh, 2016. Uh, with the first four years uh, serving as uh, first vice president and in the last two years uh, serving as state president. Um, I, you know, I'm a guy that, you know, spent most of my career in patrol before going to the union full time. Um, I served as a patrol supervisor and shift commander uh, before going to the union. Well, great. Thank you. And Mike, what how about you? Uh, t- give us a little bit of your background as well. Well, I'm the uh, current president of the Baltimore City Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 3. Um, I'm in my fourth year in that position. Um, I am a an active Baltimore uh, police detective sergeant, uh, 34 years on the job, uh, spent most of my time in narcotics, uh, executive protection, and for the last 15 years before I went to the FOP full-time, uh, I was in homicide. Right. Well, Mike, let, let's start with you. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just a, a few days before Christmas. Uh, you lost a, an officer, Kiana Holly, in a very, a very uh, just heinous crime. Uh, can you tell us uh, tell us about how how uh, just a little bit about Officer Holly, about her uh, her contribution to the community and how just how heinous this is and, and how it's affected the entire department? Yeah, it, it's uh, it was devastating and it's still devastating to. Um, I want to say the whole Baltimore community, and I know it, it, it was, you know, across the nation, uh, you know, we had sympathy cards and letters and calls from all over the country. Um, Kiana came to uh, the BPD uh, later on in life. She had been on the job for about two years. Uh, she was in uniform patrol. Um, she wanted to make a difference, and that was her goal. She wanted to make a difference in the communities that she grew up in um, and kind of saw it as a calling. And um, around the time of her death and the funeral uh, during that time, uh, the words of gratitude from the community and the officers that she worked with were just overwhelming. Um, And it's just a huge loss to Baltimore City. And she, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's so tragic when this happens, when you, when you see that, uh, she was just simply targeted for who she, for, for her job, uh, it only makes it even worse. Clyde, we, we, you know, we're coming off of, uh, 2021 was, uh, one of the most dangerous years for law enforcement officers with the amount of officers that were shot. Uh, but, but equally as important, uh, just as Kiana, uh, happened to Kiana, we've seen a 115% increase in the amount of ambush attacks on law enforcement officers across this country. Uh, share with us, uh, kind of your views on where we are in society and, and, and this attacks on law enforcement, how it's taken its toll on our profession. Yeah, so what we're seeing across the country and locally here in the state of Maryland, uh, these violent criminals uh, are not uh, scared of any uh, consequences because they are not. Uh, you know, we've got to hold them accountable. Um, we have to pass meaningful legislation that will protect our police officers, uh, that will protect our citizens and uh, remove these violent uh, bad actors uh, from our society. Um, and until we do that, uh, we will continue to struggle to have safer communities. Um, so it's important uh, that the people that are contributing to the violence uh, receive stiff punishment, uh, and we just got to remove them from uh, the, the the population in order to protect uh, the rest of uh, the people who are affected by violent crime. 
you know, a free society, the cornerstone of a free society is uh, everyone's uh, feeling of safety within their own communities and their homes. So, so I mean, this was a, it's not just an attack on, on an individual. It's attack really on our way of life in a, an American way of feeling safe and secure within your homes. You know, Mike, I, I, one huge problem we see across this country is it, it, it's, it's very frustrating. And it, I'd love to tell you that it's just a, a Baltimore problem, but it, it's happening across this country where we have prosecutors who are picking and choosing uh, crimes that they are going to, to prosecute. And the ones that they are, you know, they're letting, uh, letting offenders, we're taking them off the streets, violent offenders off the streets, only to have them put back in on the streets to, to further victimize uh, the public that we're, we're sworn, sworn to protect. And, and there's a, a, a real interesting, uh, I guess, dynamic in the fact that even, even the, the people who are charged recognize uh, that this is just a failed policy. Uh, you just recently had an individual that was uh, charged in, in Baltimore for setting his girlfriend's house on fire while she was in it. And uh, we, we have, uh, we're going to roll the tape. I want you to hear what he has to say about, uh, about his ability to get out of jail. Progressive soft on crime policies are nothing new. We've been telling you about that. But this time it's from an admitted arsonist in Baltimore who set his girlfriend's house on fire with three people inside. Thanks to a plea deal, he served just ten, uh, six months in jail. And now he's out. And he shed, said, why am I out? I was just charged with 18 different counts. That was dropped to 10. And then it was dropped to one when I shouldn't be out right now. That tells anybody that, oh, I can go shoot somebody or I can go attempt to shoot somebody and I'll be completely fine. I think that that video pretty much sums up uh, State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby's tenure as the prosecutor for Baltimore. Um, plea bargain, plea bargain, plea bargain. Um, I couldn't have said it any better than that violent felon who tried to kill three people. Um admitted to the uh, the crime, and the state's attorney had that information at the time this plea deal was made. So, you know, I, I in, in Baltimore, I think there are three issues that, you know, drive crime. And um, one is obviously the violent offenders, the short uh, sentence they're receiving, or they're out on bail committing other crimes, especially the handguns. We've got people running around out on bail with, you know, committing other violent crimes after being arrested for handguns. Um, you know, obviously Marilyn Mosby has been an issue and it is an ongoing issue, hopefully for not much longer. Um, and we have something that I call kind of the uh, backdoor defund the police. Um, it's been happening for quite a while now. And if you go back to 2015, Baltimore has lost 600 more police than they've hired. Um, and the shortage of officers, we probably got half strength in our patrol bureau. Uh, Detective Bureau is, you know, down to bare bones. Um, there are even triaging cases. We've got, they're great detectives and great officers. There's just not enough of them. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've got a number of reasons driving the crime and, uh, uh, I, I think a new prosecutor would help us in that area. Yeah, it's uh, a, a, one of the one of the main factors here is the uh, the deterrence, the deterrence on committing crime. And what 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 we're seeing across the country, and and you've seen there is, and clearly is illustrated in this uh, uh, the frustration of even the uh, even a criminal. Uh, recognizing that there's no consequences for it, for it, and therefore what it's doing is it's making it easier for people to reoffend and reoffend. So, I, I think we all agree that uh, we want to work in a criminal justice system that uh, that that fixes problems, not necessarily as you know, incarceration may not always be the uh, the answer, but at the same time we have to recognize there are some people that uh, that that clearly shouldn't be on a the street. Their violent nature uh, suggests that they're going to continue to offend. You know, uh, you know, Mike, you bring a you bring up uh, what I've been yelling. At, yelling at the top of my lungs as long as I could, a, a crisis that we are finding ourselves in in a nation. Uh, we're finding uh, law enforcement officers are leaving at a pace much higher than they've ever done in any time of our history, an instability created by those who would demonize law enforcement and strip away the rights and protections of the men and women who have to make that split-second decision. Uh, stripping it away, it's, it's, it's causing 
uh, a problem where the best and brightest, the next wave of law enforcement is not coming into uh, into this profession. Uh, so we're in a crisis situation. We know from experienced law enforcement officers that when you hire a new recruit and put them through the academy and all the things that they need to do, and then you put them in field training, uh, and and it's you're looking at a, a long term investment before you have an officer who's who's effective. I mean, we're talking years. You know, it could be three, four, five years before you have an effective officer. So you're losing them at a higher pace. You know, Clyde, if, 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 talk a little bit about what you're seeing across Maryland. Uh, and I think it's probably similar across this country that uh, the next wave of law enforcement, because of the instability that has been created by those who would rather demonize us rather than finding solutions and build trust within our communities, uh, it's creating a crisis across this country, isn't it? Yeah, Pat, and I'll, I'll use a baseball analogy. Uh, uh, traditionally, we've always had a bullpen of people ready to get into the game. Um, but we now have academy classes from multiple jurisdictions um, are now trying to merge together to make one academy class. I mean, in some cases you had 50 recruits going through and they can only get between, between 10 to 15 recruits uh, per jurisdiction when they used to run three classes a year of 50 recruits. Um, and so we now seeing our veteran police officers who have uh, stake in the game. They 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 actually uh, bring good investigations. They have the the time and experience and the relationships in our communities. Uh, those uh, men and women are deciding to leave the profession altogether. Uh, in some cases, taking early retirement. Um, I'm looking at numbers here locally, like Baltimore City, almost 500 down, uh, and one of our local uh, larger counties, Prince George's County, 400 officers down. Uh, and so we've got to find a way uh, that we can. Uh, attract, uh, that we can uh, retain, um, and, and most importantly, uh, give uh, benefits that our police officers will be uh, uh, attracted to, to be to join the, the ranks. Um, and so can we find uh, incentives out there that, that will make this job attractive? Yes. Uh, but we've got to stop with the anti-police rhetoric that is coming from our elected leaders and uh, some of our community uh, leaders. Uh, and we can start supporting our police officers. Let's attract the best and brightest. Let's retain the good guys that we had. And those that uh, are uh, due to retire, uh, let's give them an attractive benefit so they can go back to the communities and serve uh, in another capacity. Uh, you're, you're so right. Uh, if you, it really is the, it's the future of, of, of law enforcement. Uh, our need and our ability, ability to be able to attract is directly related to the stability things that are necessary. The best and the brightest uh, can take jobs anywhere. Uh, the, the, it takes, you know, law enforcement officers are, are average people that are called upon to do some pretty extraordinary things at times. It takes a certain temperament. It takes a, a certain, uh, you know, quality of an individual. And, and, and that's what we need to do. We need to find better ways to, to attract them and, 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 and bring them into this profession. And it starts with public officials stopping a rhetoric, Finding solutions to problems, those, those solutions start with a, just a simple fact-based conversation. Unfortunately, in society today, we've gotten to a point where there's, there's, there's not enough fact-based uh, discussions where we find solutions to problems. We're too, uh, too, too embedded to, to try and be right in, uh, in what we believe. And it's doing some irreparable harm to, to the law enforcement profession in our communities. It's making our jobs, and it's making our communities less safe. Kiana uh, Holly was... Uh, she was more than just an officer. She has a, a, a very interesting story of, of why she chose to be a law enforcement officer. And, and I, yeah, I think you could argue that she's she was all that was right with the uh, Baltimore Police Department. We need more Kianas. We need more people to step up because they have a true true desire to serve the community. What will it take? What, what needs to happen in Baltimore in order to attract more Kianas to come into this profession and truly improve the quality of life within their communities? You know, Pat, really and truly, we we really want to turn this thing around in Baltimore. It, it is in a bad state. It still is. We've got a police commissioner and a state's attorney, Mosby, um, who seem to want to prosecute and demonize police officers in Baltimore and more than they want to go after violent criminals. And, um, you know, just going back, you know, to chasing people out of the profession here in Baltimore and keeping people away. I mean, obviously we have a state's attorney still seated um, going back to the Baltimore riots and the Freddie Gray situation. Um, there was a, an investigation done on the Baltimore six that uh, were eventually uh, indicted in that case by the uh, Baltimore police homicide unit, one of the best in the country. 
And uh, embedded with them was a reporter from the Baltimore Sun for transparency purposes. And um, they took the case to Marilyn Mosby and said, hey, there is no criminal conduct here. And, you know, within, I guess, maybe about a week, she went and found a command member sheriff who's assigned over at the courthouse who'd never done a criminal investigation before. And he brought it to a grand jury and got indictments. Now, we all know that uh, I think three of them went to trial and the others were dropped and they're all found not guilty, all found not guilty. So we have a prosecutor that will shop her case and not follow the rule of law. And what that does um, to recruiting and retention is devastating. It just it is one of the most devastating things we have still ongoing here. And um, until that's solved, I mean, she has shown that she will stretch these cases as far as she can, trying to get a, a, a case in court, put another notch in her belt. Um, and you don't see that zeal for prosecution when it comes to violent offenders. You just don't see it. Well, it's a, uh, you know, imagine the outrage if a, a law enforcement officer who, uh, who had such prejudice with their uh, with their investigations that they uh, they they set it up for a certain outcome, uh, and it's uh, she's it's the very thing that uh, that flies in the face of of a fair and just system, uh, and that's where we're finding ourselves in a place in time right now, and it just makes our job so much harder. And I you know, appreciate uh, all the you know men and women who suit up and show up every day to make a difference in their communities because this is a it's a very volatile time, and especially in certain cities. You know, if you look across the country, it's really interesting. You you can't argue, uh, you know, I've heard many arguments that really what we're seeing across this country, increase in crimes and, and, and attacks uh, of law enforcement officers somehow related to COVID and a number of other things. Now, we can't argue that that COVID didn't have, a, you know, some some factor in all of this, the isolation and all. But, but I'm going to ask a simple question. You know, if you look across the country and you see cities with populations of similar sizes, but you see a different uh, a, a different approach by public officials within those cities, there's got to be a good reason why there's not a hundred or two hundred percent increase in 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 crime in 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 some cities as opposed to others. So it truly is all about a partnership. And I think uh, I think there's a a misconception here that uh, that many would like to paint the law enforcement officers as a problem within a community. In reality, we're all stakeholders of uh, of the success of every community. Uh, it's when we're starting to be isolated that is really creating the problems we see across this country. We all live here. You know, we live in these communities. We want them to succeed. This is the place where we work. We want our place to we work to want our communities and our jobs to be safer. We want our kids to be safe in school. We want to make a difference. We want to be part of that. But it all starts with with some kind of collective effort and, and not demonizing and isolating others uh, out of it. So, you know, it's a uh, it, it's very, very tough time for us. And, and, and God, you know, God bless all of the, the men and women who are brave enough to, to do this job right now. Uh, gentlemen, I'm going to ask, uh, you know, just to kind of. Right now, we're going to wrap this up, but I'm going to ask you, and Clyde, I'll start with you. There's a message here. There's a message here for law enforcement officers in, in, in the state of Maryland who are out there doing a job there every day. But there's also a message for the public officials, those who make the decisions. You know, if you if you could talk to them right now and, and tell them, hey, this is, you know, some encouragement of where we need to go uh, in, in a path to, to, to move to a more stable time and, 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 and improve the quality of life within our communities. What would you say? Well, the best way, uh, and thanks for the question, Pat, uh, the best way uh, for us to repair uh, the broken relationships uh, between uh, police and community uh, is to understand uh, that our police officers are not occupiers. Um, we are not uh, threatening forces. Um, we are partners. Um, we work with our communities. And the one thing we can, uh, you know, we can all say is we all want to succeed. Uh, we are stakeholders. We're coaches in the community. We we uh, go to the little league games. Uh, we coach the little league teams. We coach. We mentor uh, young people. If we can identify the social drivers of community, uh, which is a strong faith base, a strong educational system, and strong families, uh, there will be less need uh, for cops, courts, and corrections to be involved. Uh, so we've got to look at uh, uh, these different uh, entities and see how we can make our community stronger. Uh, by just partnering with our local police departments. And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, dancing cops. That's not community policing. 
Um, let's get away from uh, the rhetoric. And uh, the only way a relationship can be repaired if both sides want to be, wants to repair it. And it starts with both our police officers and our community sitting down and having courageous conversations about facts. Like you said, fact based conversations. And we can start to repair those relationships. Yeah. And add to that a mutual respect. Uh, that's, Absolutely. that's a key factor. It has to be part of Mike. Same thing for you. I mean, you're, you're, you've got, you've got, uh, you've got such a, such an awesome group of, uh, men and women that are, that are showing up every day in, in Baltimore and, and, uh, doing their best in a very tense situation. Uh, and, and you have public officials, if you had an opportunity to tell them where we need to be, what we need to do, how do we get past this uh, how, collectively? What would you say? I, I'm not going to repeat what Clyde said. I agree with him wholeheartedly. Um, but what I would add is our legislator in Annapolis, they're in session right now. And last year was a bad session for uh, law enforcement in Maryland coming out of the legislator legislature. Um, but this year we were hoping for a little sanity down there and we're not seeing it. And, um, you know, if you keep, if you keep pushing down good officers and, you put them in a box, they're going to work out of that box and it's going to affect the crime fight negatively. And, you know, I go back to the analogy. Um, you know, if you, if you've got a family and you've got six kids and you've got one bad one, you don't penalize all six kids every time the one does bad. You, you work with the one and you let the other five do what they know how to do as good people. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, our legislature, um, you know, our state's attorney, our consent decree has really and truly put us all in the same frame as any bad police officer they may prosecute. And it's just not the way to conduct business. It's just not. Yeah, so true. Uh, really, at the end of the day, all we all want to be part of a solution. And uh, if we all do the parts that we uh, that we were either elected or hired to do and took an oath to do, then then this this actually would be a lot easier than uh, than it sounds. Uh, the problem is, is we have others. You know, we have some that are just uh, just not invested in finding a, a, a united path towards us. So, guys, I want to thank you. This is like as I say, we this is a very difficult time to be in law enforcement. It's a uh, it's equally different time representing the men and women who show up every day. So I want to thank you each for, uh, for what you're doing. If someone wants to know more information about, uh, about Maryland, uh, uh, fraternal order police in Baltimore, uh, why don't you give a, why don't you give a plug on, on best way to, to follow through on that. Claude, go with you first. Yeah. So we, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, the Maryland state, uh, FOP, uh, website, uh, webpage. And we also have another, um, website that we're running. It's called uh, keep Maryland safe. So that's www.keepmarylandsafe.com. That's www.keepmarylandsafe.com. Right. Thank you, Mike. Um, you can send, uh, you can, you can follow us on Twitter at Baltimore city for turn order, police at lodge three. Um, you can also, uh, we have a, we have a webpage also shows the activities, what we're involved in FOP three Baltimore city. Um, yeah. Um, and, you know, I just want to let everybody know across the country that, you know, the outreach during uh, Officer Holly's death, um, again, we can't thank you enough. Wow. Hang in there, everybody. Well, thank you very much, guys. And again, uh, thank you for serving those who serve, uh, at, at, especially at, at this very difficult time. And I'd like to, to, to thank our, uh, our listeners and our viewers uh, tuning in on with the, with the Blue View, where we talk about the, the issues that are important to the men and women who suit up and show up in communities all across America every day to make the community safe and our jobs safer. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode of The Blue View. Hosted by Patrick Gills, National President of the Fraternal Order of Police. To catch our next episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review. To get the latest from the National FOP, make sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at GLFOP and on Instagram at FOP National. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.